More, we turn to New Mexico and focus correspondent Terry Cusare, who recently sat down with acclaimed psychologist Dr. Richard Washak, author of the book Divorce, Poison, How to Protect Your Family from Bad Mouthing and Brainwashing. Out of all the things you could have chosen for your career, why did you decide to focus on divorce and specifically the effects that it has on the children involved? Well, like most of these career decisions, it was sort of a mixture of uh, accident and some, some purpose behind it. But around 30 years ago, I was a, a, a psychology intern and I was working at a, a place called the Dallas Child Guidance Clinic. And the first three children that were assigned to me were all boys from divorced homes. Mm -hmm. And I wondered, you know, does this have something to do with the divorce? Or is it just a coincidence? So I began studying, reading up of uh, the research literature and found that sure enough, children from divorced homes do have a greater uh, likelihood of developing problems and needing some assistance. Uh, and I noticed that all the studies were boys who were growing up with mothers in mother custody homes. So that became the focus of my doctoral dissertation, which uh, looked, it was the first study that looked at children who were growing up in father custody homes, which was pretty unusual back then. Sure. And then comparing those to the children in the mother custody homes. And, uh, and that turned out to be a very sort of uh, revealing study. We found that uh, you couldn't generalize about the effects of divorce, that a lot depended on the particular circumstances of the child. And, and then uh, when I think about, though, why that was so attractive to me, I realized that I'd, oh, my, my father grew up without his father. When my father was two years old, his dad was struck by a, 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 car, a horse-drawn cart and killed. And I had always wondered, what was that like for my dad to grow up without his dad? So I think those two things came together. And I, you know, I uh, did my dissertation. And very soon after that, Time Magazine wrote about my study. Well, you know, that was totally unexpected. And that sort of set my course. I realized this was, you know, this was something that needed to be investigated more. I, I, I didn't want to drop it at that point. And so I continued my studies, uh, uh, looking at children in, uh, whose parents had remarried. And, uh, and that all culminated in my very first book, The Custody Revolution, um, which talked about the damage to children when a parent would abandon them, when after divorce they spent a lot of time with one parent and not enough time with the other. And the kids were telling me that wasn't enough for them. All the measures we used of, uh, to look at how well they were doing psychologically were showing that they were disadvantaged by that. The ones who were doing the best were the ones who had two parents involved in their lives. And uh, so I wrote about that. And what happened is I began getting letters from people who were complaining not, uh, not a child whose father abandoned him, but I was getting letters from people saying, from parents, saying that the children were rejecting them. Mm -hmm. And that became the focus of my next group of studies and, and culminated in, in the book, Divorce Poison. I wonder, we've all heard about folks who quote unquote stay together for the sake of the children. What is the best way? Is, are we doing more harm by actually staying together and poisoning our children that way? Or is it better to go ahead and get that divorce and help those kids find the mental help that they need to approach that in a healthy situation. I mean, there's so many questions in association with this. We scarcely know where to begin. Right, well, you know, I think it's a mistake to automatically assume that a divorce is gonna leave terrible scars on a child. It really depends on how the parents manage it, how they handle it. Uh, of course, the breakup of a family is a sad event, and so it's not something to be done lightly. Uh, and, uh, particularly if your marriage has a chance of being salvaged, you want to do that. But you're giving your children no gift if you raise them in an unhappy, conflict-ridden home if a divorce is going to solve some of those problems, if a divorce really is going to be able to give the child an opportunity to grow up without being constantly exposed to a war between you know, the parents. That malice. Yes. Yeah, the malice can hurt uh, is, as much, if not more, than, than the divorce. And uh, it all depends on how the divorce is handled. Some people do it well. Other people 
uh, are so disappointed in the failure of the marriage that they can't get over it. And, the, and in the worst cases, and the ones I write about in, in this book, the parents use their children as a weapon in, in the war. They use their children to express their anger. Certainly we've seen the, you be sure to tell your father this, and your mother did such and such, oh. you know, using that sounding board kind of thing and the damage that that does to the kids is just incredible because it forces the children to take sides. Well, it certainly pressures them to take sides. You know, your mom cares more about her boyfriend than she does about you. And, you know, uh, why don't you ask your dad if he can pay some more money? Otherwise, we won't be able to go on a vacation this year. Sure. Uh, it puts the kids in the middle. Some children manage it like little diplomats. They go back and forth from one home to the other mm -hmm. as a diplomat goes back and forth between warring countries. And somehow they manage to stay out of the fray. Other children, though, succumb to that pressure. They feel like they have no choice but to take sides with whichever parent has the most influence over them. And, and, and I would imagine who they're spending the most time with as well. In, in, in the majority of the cases, that's true. But we're learning now that children can really be turned against the parent they spend the most time with. I've seen mm. families where children might see their dad only in the summer but they go to spend the summer with him and he turns them around. They don't want to come back to their mom. Uh, I've seen uh, situations where the children are actually living with a parent and will destroy that parent's property and act as a spy for the other parent going through their papers. Um, so it's there, you, it's, this is one of those areas where you just can't generalize. Uh, that it, You can be the parent who has the uh, most amount of time with the children and still the children could turn against you. Dr. Warshak, are you finding that there are more father custody cases these days than, as you mentioned, you know, early on, it was pretty traditional that the kids ended up with the mother? Well, you know, things have really changed some since I wrote The Custody Revolution. In that book, I recommended reforms that would keep fathers more involved with their children, particularly, you know, fathers who had something very positive to offer their children. And since that, these reforms have really been uh, accepted throughout the United States. So uh, we very often will see mothers and fathers sharing custody uh, where the children spend a lot more than just the every other weekend with their dad. What brings you to Albuquerque? Well, actually, the, there's a uh, what's called a trial institute to train attorneys who have cases that involve allegations of alienation and of divorce poison. Uh, and because these are so difficult, these cases, they're difficult for the judges and they're difficult for the attorneys who are representing a parent. They need to know what they've got. Is the parent psychologically abusing the child? Is the parent doing a good job of protecting the child? And that's why the child's not going to the other home. So the, the lawyers want to know, how do we try these cases? What do we have to look out for? What are some tips on how best to manage these? And the judges want to know, too, how can we sort out what's really going on in the family. So I'm here to sort of participate in, in, in an institute where attorneys and judges are going to be trained. Could you give us a quick definition of divorce poison? Divorce poison are the behaviors and the attitudes, all the things a parent does that could undermine the child's love and respect for the other parent so that it can be, sometimes it's done very deliberately, like a, a mother who hides airplane tickets that a dad sends to see the children and then says, sorry, your dad doesn't care enough about you and doesn't love you enough to send the tickets, mm -hmm. to a, a parent who is not realizing that the children are overhearing all the bad mouth, you know, not appreciating how much it's hurting the children. It's just venting the kind of anger that anyone normally feels after divorce. And certainly I've known of cases where the parents can even blame the children for their choice in, in a mate or a spouse. And that's very confusing for the children. It, it, it sure is. And the children start feeling a lot of pressure to really reject the other parent as, as a way of showing loyalty. Mm -hmm. that they, they, or they feel like they've got to report bad things about the other parent, that mm -hmm. dad wants to hear negative things about mom. When we talk about how much fun we're having with her, he doesn't want to hear it. Right. Or, you know, mom doesn't, mom doesn't want to hear the fun we had at dad's house. And so the children feel like, you know, I've got to do, I've got to take care 
of my mom or dad's needs instead of the other way around. That loyalty thing. It's a loyalty thing and it's also a, a, a mixture of roles because children are the ones who are supposed to be taken care of by adults. It's not a child's job to meet a parent's emotional needs. Is there any particular age for folks who may be thinking about a divorce and what might be best for their kids, is there any particular age or any kind of guidelines that the parents as thinking adults could use to evaluate? You know, much as we uh, wish we had a formula for that, it really doesn't exist. You know, there are, uh, in general, we think that perhaps a child's a little better able to manage the feelings that go along with the divorce if they're at least old enough to understand it and maybe four or five years old. Uh, but a lot depends on how you know, the parents handle it. Uh, we do know that it's more difficult for younger children to be apart from either parent for too long a period of time. So if you're going to get divorced and you have a child under the age of four or so, you really want to try to stay in the same geographical area. And a lot of times the courts will order that to be the case, that the parents must stay within the state or within a certain amount of, of you know, reachability, if you will. Sometimes they do. It really depends sometimes on the specific case, on the reasons that a parent has for wanting to move far away from the other parent. In some cases, there are some very good reasons and you can understand why it needs to be done. In other cases, though, it's being done specifically because they don't think the, the parent they're leaving behind is that important for the child to spend time with. One of the things you talk about is avoiding the seven common errors made by rejected parents. Could you quickly touch upon those for us so that folks will have the ability to go out and get your book and avoid some of these trouble areas? I sure can because the most frequent comment I get from readers of the book is that they made every one of those errors sure. because they're natural to do. One error is to overreact to the child who, who rejects you or complains about having to spend time with you. It's a natural thing for a parent to do, but it just doesn't work. Uh, some parents get too angry and that scares the child, makes them even less likely to want to spend time with you. Some parents will reject the child themselves. They'll say, if you don't want to spend time here, you go back to your other home and when you're ready to come here, then I'll see you. These parents don't realize that that may be the beginning of the end of the relationship, that the children won't come back. They go back to their other house and that parent says, boy, I guess he doesn't really care very much about seeing you and, and that may be the end of it. Uh, of course it's a mistake to retaliate by bad mouthing the other parent. That doesn't help or trying to get the children to take sides with you against the other parent. That just keeps the children in the middle, makes things even worse for them. Uh, so the, these are the sorts of things you want to avoid. You've got to have a thick skin. When you're a parent and a child is being so critical, these children can act really in a very contemptible manner. Sure. Um, and normally when a child acts that way, you want to lecture them, you want to punish them for being so disrespectful, but that just doesn't work. And you can't talk them out of their feelings either. So you've got to have a thick skin, you've got to show them that you're not the demon that you might have been painted as. Uh, you have to be patient with them, you have to try to remind them of the better times you've had in the past and show them that they can enjoy being with you.